good to be with you as we gather to worship God. I'd like to draw some your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. Uh, please turn in your poinsettia order forms to Wendy today. Um, the first annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony is in uh, town this evening. The carolin will play at 6 o'clock. They'll light the Christmas tree at 6.15, and then everyone's invited to stick around for caroling and hot chocolate and cookies. Next Saturday is McCoysville's annual Christmas tea, and you are invited to that. It's at 1 o'clock. Next Sunday, the session will meet for prayer at 8.45 a.m. Okay. Um, then after worship next Sunday, we will decorate... Uh, for Advent, and the youth group is coming over, and they will uh, learn about what our decorations mean to us, and also uh, make some banners to decorate our sanctuary with. Then, in the afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, everyone at Lost Creek and Trinity are invited to get together and go caroling in, uh, the, at the homes of our homebound members. Uh, we'll meet at Trinity at 4 o'clock. So um, we'll pass around the sign-up sheet for that. Uh, the sign-up sheet helps us to know how many we have coming, so we know how many uh, homes to visit and how much food to prepare. Also, if you signed up to donate hamburger for the barbecue next Sunday, Kathy said to you're you're making right. Uh, Kathy said to bring it next Sunday at church, and then she will turn it into delicious barbecue. Uh, also, we're going to pass around the sign-up sheet for the women's Christmas banquet. That is Monday, December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Uh, a meat will be provided, and then everyone is invited to bring a covered dish. The Secret Sisters will be revealed, um, but you do not have to be a part of the, w, uh, the Women of the Church meetings on Tuesday nights, or uh, one of the Secret Sisters participates. This is open to all the women in the church. Trustees, uh, please be aware that uh, we rescheduled our trustees meeting from November to December 6 at 6.30 p.m. If you... Um, signed up to bring donations for the care packages for our homebound members, uh, please bring them on December 9th, and we will assemble them after worship, and then we need help taking them out. Also, on uh, December 9th, bring your Christmas gifts for the Christmas angels. And uh, if you did not get a chance to sponsor one of our Christmas angels, or if you are looking for somebody else to help, the Welcome Center at St. Jude uh, Catholic Church still has 70 children that they are looking to get Christmas gifts for. Uh, and in the bulletin, there's a place you can mail donations if you would like to send them money so that they can shop. Or uh, we can contact them and they will give you a, a child to shop for. <coughs> we are finishing up decorating our mitten tree today. And those donations will go to Head Start. We are also collecting containers of uh, cake icing for the Christmas uh, boxes that will be handed out at the food pantry. And uh, McCoysville is back to collecting empty pill bottles. If you would have any empty pill bottles you want to donate, please take all the labels off and wash them out. And then they will ship them to the Matthew 25 Ministries, which distributes them throughout the world. Are there other announcements? Um, I do, I would like to meet with the women of the church right after worship. Uh, just for a brief meeting, and also on the bulletin board is information about the Genad County Head Start program. If you know anyone who has children uh, who are in need of Head Start services, they have uh, openings for children, and uh, you, there's an application we can you can take or we can make copies of. I am please spread the word about uh, the opportunities for children in Head Start. If there are no other announcements, let us worship God. The true light, which enlightens everyone, has come into the world. To all who receive him, who believe in his name, 
He gives the power to become children of God. Let's continue with our call to worship. Thanks and praise to you, Jesus Christ, King and Lord of all, given the name above every other name. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. King of righteousness, King of peace, enthroned at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Great High Priest, living forever to intercede for us. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Pioneer of our salvation, you bring us to glory through your death and resurrection. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Every knee bows to you, every tongue confesses, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, it is your will to restore all things in your dear Son. Bring together under his just and gentle rule all the peoples of the world, now divided and torn apart by sin. For he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This morning as we pray for the churches and ministries of our presbytery, we are praying for the Honduras Partnership um, and our... Mission Honduras Mission co-worker Dory K. Helmerson. The third generation of Presbyterian pastors called to mission service in her family, Dory Helmerson, is rooted in mission. She was born and raised in the southwest U.S. border, a multicultural, multilingual region. She has spent time living and working in central Kentucky, too. As Dory explains, she finds energy and divine transformation in border regions. She believes that humans are enriched by recognizing and engaging with our own internal and external borders. The concept of God's presence among and preference for the poor and oppressed, and not the rich and powerful, is a thread that runs through the entirety of Scripture. I believe Jesus Christ's purpose was to overturn the power structures of his time, and in following Jesus Christ, that is my purpose too. She prays that all Christians will commit to work that is anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, and antithetical to the dominating mainstream culture of division and fear. Prior to working with Presbyterian World Mission in Honduras, Dory served as a chaplain providing spiritual care to hospice patients with inpatients and a critical care burn unit, as well as in behavioral health and medical surgical units. Educated as a journalist, Dory has also been a reporter. Reverend Helmarsson moved to Tegucigalpa. <laughs> moved to Honduras this fall to begin working in, or in organization, leadership, and theological development with the Presbyterian Church of Honduras. She will serve as the primary Presbyterian World Mission Liaison to the Honduras Mission Network, providing in-country experience as well as coordinating the partnership between the Presbyterian Church of Honduras and the PCUSA. She will coordinate and coach lay and pastoral leadership in the Presbyterian Church of Honduras as the denomination seeks to strengthen leadership capacity and broaden theological education. The Presbyterian Church in Honduras consists of 18 Presbyterian churches located in a 60-mile radius of the capital city. These enthusiastic... enthusiastic These enthusiastically serve church attendees Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Honduras is a largely mountainous, sparsely populated country in Central America, once the center of the Mayan Empire. Throughout most of the 20th century, the country was dominated by military dictatorships. Since the late 1980s, democracy has strengthened. Having improved slightly since 1990, the per capita income of the country is one of the lowest in Latin America. Dory's selection was a process involving World Mission, the Honduras Mission Network, and the Presbyteries of Arkansas, Carlisle, and Tampa Bay. With the continued financial support of these Presbyteries for Dory's salary, as well as their prayers, the hope is that the partnership continue to strengthen for the Honduran churches there. The Presbyteries Mission Advo Advocacy Committee supports this ministry and future trips to the country. 
And the scripture is Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. And uh, I would like to say um, a year or two, well, two years ago, uh, our presbytery heard the call to join together with these other presbyteries in sponsoring a mission co-worker to go to Honduras. Our missionaries, our uh, denomination did not have uh, enough money to support all of our missionaries around the world. And so they had to recall a few of our uh, missionaries, including those in Honduras. And we had already developed a partnership with Honduras. And so we talked with um, the Presbyterian Mission Agency and said, if we can come up with the pledges for the money for a missionary position there, can we have a missionary there? And they said, sure. And so a couple of years ago, uh, our church, uh, as well as other churches in our presbytery, made a pledge and supported pulling together the money necessary to provide for her income as she goes and ministers there. So uh, Dory uh, was, our presbytery was one of the presbyteries um, responsible for being able to get Dory there. And not only does she help support the churches there in their education of their pastors and lay leaders, she also helps coordinate uh, mission trips from the United States uh, to Honduras. So please keep her and that ministry uh, in your prayers. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then the religious leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. <coughs> Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, What is truth? The Lord always blesses the reading and hearing of his holy word. It's time I invite our young people to come up for our time to go. Hey guys, how are we doing? Are you sure? Okay, yeah, good. Um, when you hear the word king, uh, what do you think of? Okay, a master, yeah. A castle, all right. Okay, someone wearing a crown. Yeah, what does a king look like? Where's the crown? Okay, often they wear their royal robes, right? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and sometimes they carry a scepter, it's a mace. Show their authority. Uh -huh. yeah. um, look around the sanctuary here. Do you see uh, anything that looks like a sign of a king? Something that would be a symbol of a king. Yeah. What are you pointing at? Okay. Why? Why does that remind you of kings? Okay. So the uh, those are actually brass. But yes, um, the uh, the flower vases. Uh, look goldish, and uh, we think of kings having, you know, gold and lots of money. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Um, the candle. The candle, why? Mm -hmm. How does that remind you of, of kings? Um, 
Do you have a reason, an idea why a candle is reminded of kings? Okay. Well, you're starting to move us in a new direction there. When a candle is lit, it reminds us that Jesus is present, right? Yeah. And uh, we've been talking in, in our worship, in our call to worship, and in our prayers about how Jesus is a king. There's one thing here that is uh, a sign that Jesus is a king, but you probably wouldn't think of it as being a sign that he's a king. What were you going to say? The cross. the cross, that's right. The cross was the instrument of Jesus' death. And we typically don't think of a king dying, or especially like a criminal, because that's the way they killed criminals 2,000 years ago, they nailed them to crosses. Um, so how is a cross a sign that Jesus is a king? Well, kings have, uh, there's two parts to being a king. One is that kings are supposed to care for and protect the people uh, under them, the people that they rule over. And the other part <coughs> is that kings are supposed to, uh, people are supposed to uh, serve the king, right? Now, a lot of people who are kings or who are bosses or who are in charge of things like that second part. They like the idea of everybody else doing what they tell them to do and doing things for them. But the important part about being a king is that you are supposed to care for and protect other people. How does Jesus care for and protect people with the cross? Uh -huh. That's right. Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, to protect us from sin, and to bring us back to, to God and to be back as uh, citizens of the kingdom of God. And so that cross is a reminder that Jesus is a king because Jesus served and protected us. So that's an important thing for you to remember as we celebrate Jesus Christ as the king who is present with us. Uh, let's pray. Would you pray after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for being our king. Thank you for taking care of us. Help us to recognize you as our king. Amen. All right. Thank you for our time together. So as you may have noticed uh, in our scripture readings and our prayers and our liturgy, uh, that our focus today is on Christ as a king. We have come full circle in the church liturgical year. Uh, we have come to the end where we celebrate Christ as king. And when you think of Christ as king, what sort of thoughts go through your mind? Him riding in on the donkey, people throwing palms underneath. Okay, so the images of uh, Palm Sunday, riding in on a donkey. Others? Another uh, image that I think uh, is often in, in the foreground for us when we talk about Christ as being king, is we think about how Christ ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the throne of God, and the promise that one day Christ would return. And so we often have this image of Christ in His glory returning to earth, uh, using His power to put an end to all earthly uh, kingdoms, and drawing all people to Himself. And I was just thinking about uh, the news that we've uh, been hearing over the last few days, you know, Thursday we celebrated Thanksgiving. As a nation, we were supposed to be celebrating all the things that we are thankful for, all the good things in our lives. And then uh, Thursday evening started the Black Friday shopping rush, and we started hearing the, the crazy stories of people fighting over the last TV that's on sale. Uh, somebody pulled a knife on and stabbed somebody else. Somebody else got shot. Somebody, the wrong person got shot. Uh, just these horrible stories of the viciousness of humanity. And it's not just here in the United States, and it's not just these isolated incidents um, around shopping. Uh, we see it around the world. Uh, I was reading a story this morning in the news about uh, all the child soldiers in Africa. Uh, and how do you deal with 
you know, how do you as a uh, police officer or as a peacekeeper deal with children shooting at you uh, with weapons, knowing that they have been forced into this position? And we hear stories of uh, man's inhumanity to man all around the world. And that image of Christ as king, of Christ returning in power and glory, gives us a little bit of hope. That this isn't the way it's always going to be. That one day Christ will return in his power as king over all, and will put an end to all of this. But even as we think about Christ's power and, and Christ's glory and Christ being a king, we need to remember what uh, it means for Christ when he says, I am a king, and what he is teaching us. Our scripture lesson this morning might seem kind of a strange passage to be reading on Christ the King Sunday, because it's not a story of Jesus in his power and glory uh, riding into Bethel, or riding into Jerusalem, or riding uh, on the clouds to return to earth. Instead, it's a story of when he has been arrested and is about to face crucifixion. Now, there's a, a real irony in this story. Jesus is turned over to the Romans by the Jewish religious leaders. They see Jesus as a threat. They see him as a threat to their authority. They see him as a threat to the, uh, to the peace, the fragile peace that they have with the Romans. They see him as a threat to their understanding of what their faith is all about. And so they want to get rid of Jesus. They believe that their faith, their beliefs, and their rituals are what draw them closer to God and make them closer to God. And these religious leaders are the keepers of those beliefs and the keepers of those rituals. And in fact, this is all taking place during Passover, one of the most important rituals in the Jewish uh, faith. A story about uh, the people's exodus from Egypt to freedom. But think about what is happening here. In order to get rid of this threat in their lives, they are having to resort to breaking the very laws they claim to protect and uphold and teach to the other people. They have to bring false accusations and charges against Jesus in order to get the Romans to prosecute him and execute him. Is it one of the uh, Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. And yet they resort to that in order to uh, get rid of Jesus. And in doing that, they are seeking to get Jesus executed on the cross. When Pilate asks them, you know, take, or says to them, take him and, and prosecute him yourself, they say, we are not allowed to put anyone to death. Well, we do know that they could put people to death, their own, their own members of their Jewish faith, for, uh, for moral failures, they could stone somebody to death. John points out that this was to show what type of death Jesus would die. They wanted him to be executed as a criminal, to be strung up on the cross for all to see that he was a failure. So they bear false witness against Jesus, and in doing so, they are seeking his execution. They are seeking to kill him. Isn't one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. So they have broken two of the basic, fundamental, foundational laws that they claim to be teaching and upholding, and that they see Jesus to be a threat against. How ironic. But perhaps even more ironic than that, is that this is happening during Passover, and they've completely missed the point of Passover. Remember that Passover is a story of how the, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and God came to them and rescued them from that slavery through the ten plagues. And that Passover was about that last plague, where the people sacrificed a lamb and spread the blood on the doorposts of their house, and the angel of death passed over the, their homes and killed the firstborn in the Egyptian families, 
And the Egyptians and the Pharaoh said, that's enough. Get out of here. Leave. But think about what all of that is saying, that tradition. They were slaves. They were not a powerful people to be uh, desired by a god. They were not an upright and righteous people. They were not a rich people. They were the lowest of the low. There was nothing about them who would make them desirable to a god or to a king except the fact that God loved them. And God had made a promise to be with them and to bless them. And it was God who was acting to protect them and to fulfill his promise to bring them to freedom. It was God's action on their behalf, not their actions. And yet here they are, feeling like they have to protect their authority and their beliefs and their rituals, that they have to act. During that very holy day, it was a reminder of God's action in their lives. While the Jewish leaders may have missed this, Jesus does not. Jesus uh, recognizes that it is God who acted in that long ago time in the uh, setting God's people free from, from slavery in Egypt. And it is now God who is acting through Jesus to rescue all people, not just the Jews, but all people, from their slavery to sin, to set them free. In fact, the Gospel of John uh, has Jesus' last meal with his disciples a day earlier than the other Gospels, so that he has his last meal with his disciples before Passover begins, not the Passover meal. And there's a reason for this. Jesus will ultimately be executed on the cross at the same time that the Passover lambs are being sacrificed at the temple and being prepared for the Passover meal. So John is reminding us that Jesus is the sacrifice for our salvation. Jesus says that this uh, action of his is teaching the truth. But what truth is he teaching? As I was uh, talking with the kids, I pointed out that a king's job is not just to be served by his loyal subjects. The king's job is to uh, watch over and protect his, his subjects. And that is what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is a king because he is laying down his life to set people free from sin and to restore them to a right relationship to God, to bring them back into the kingdom of God. He is sacrificing his life for our well-being. And that is the truth about God. When we think about God, and we think about God's power and God's, God's glory and God's holiness, we often do think, of God sitting on his throne in heaven, looking down upon the world and pointing his finger and exercising power over different events and over different lives. What we often miss is what Jesus was teaching us about God through his death on the cross. That God ultimately is a God who created all of us, considers all of us his children, loves each and every one of us, and is willing to even give his own life so that we can be his children and live as his family and to be in his kingdom. That is ultimately what God's power is all about. That he is willing to give his life for our salvation. And that's the truth about God that Jesus came to share with us. <coughs> And it's important for us to remember that when we are thinking about what it means to say Christ is King. As we look around the world at, around us and we see all of these stories of violence and inhumanity, 
And perhaps even as we look at our own lives and think of the way other people have hurt us, there's a part of us that might long for that day when Christ the King in power and glory will come and put an end to it all. And finally, our lives will be at peace. But remember that that King coming in power and glory is the one who loves all of us and is willing to give his life for all of us. We have to remember that is the king that we are called to serve. This morning, uh, we are continuing our tradition of having uh, the kirking of the tartan. Uh, we started this here at uh, Lost Creek when Ethan got interested in his uh, Scottish heritage and learning to play the bagpipes, and he would pipe in our uh, banner, and we would have a kirking of the tartans. Uh, the, ser the whole kirking of the tartan, tartan started in the 1940s, uh, Reverend Peter Marshall was the chaplain of the Senate at the time. We were in World War II, and um, Peter Marshall was seeking to raise funds to uh, help people in Scotland and England who were trying to get away from the violence in the war and were looking for protection. And so uh, one Sunday he shared about a legend, and, and the legend was the Kirking of the Tartan. Uh, kirk is the Scottish word for church. Tartan is the emblem of each family or clan in Scotland. And according to the legend, back when Bonnie Prince Charlie was defeated at the Battle of Culloden, and England once again ruled over Scotland, England tried to subjugate the Scottish people by, one, taking away their weapons, which would make sense, but also by uh, preventing them from wearing their tartans and their kilts the symbols of their Scottish heritage. And by taking that away from them, they hoped that the Scottish people would fall in line and live more like English people. And according to tradition, that was the way it was for over 50 years. And, but according to that tradition, the Scots are very stubborn people and uh, would not give up their heritage that easily. And though they may not have been allowed to wear a kilt and wear a tartan, According to the legend, they would keep a, a piece of their tartan close to their hearts. And on a, a certain Sunday each year, when they came to church, the pastor would insert a blessing into the prayers over the tartans and over the, the uh, families. And uh, each of the families would touch that piece of tartan on their heart. And they would pledge their loyalty to the church for another year. And so this perking of the tartan became um, a story to encourage people to commit themselves to the service of the church and to the service of God. And we continue that tradition here today, and we will do that in a little bit. But we need to remember, what is it that we are committing our families to this day? What is it that we are committing ourselves to each day? When we hear those stories of violence out in the world around us, when we are dealing with people in our day-to-day -day lives who make our lives miserable, it is easy to want Christ to return and to put an end to it all. But we need to remember that those are the very people that God loves. Those are the very people that Jesus died on the cross for. Those are the very people that God is seeking to bring back to himself. And if we truly believe that Jesus Christ is king, and if we are his loyal subjects, then we are being called to follow the example set by Christ and to live our lives in service to those very people who annoy us, who make our lives miserable, that we would rather have nothing to do with. May we commit ourselves to following Christ today and every day and live our lives in service to them. Amen.
teach thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bring thee forth the fruit of good works. May of thee be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this morning we are going to have our uh, Kirking of the Tartar, and uh, Sam is going to bring in... Sam is going to bring in our uh, banner. Um, you can go ahead and open the door if you want, Sam. Uh, and we don't have Ethan with us with his bagpipes this morning, so uh, we're going to uh, hear uh, Amazing Grace, and then she'll bring the banner forward, and I invite you to join with me in the, uh, bless the uh, procession, the blessing of the Tartans printed in your bulletin. And then uh, I want to teach you a, a hymn I learned a couple of weeks ago. So. Uh... <coughs>
not sing our praise song today. We will close with our benediction. Just a reminder, I'd like to meet with the women of the church uh, just briefly here at the front. And don't forget our Christmas tree lighting down in uh, town later today. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit descend upon you all and be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.